Hi, I'm Derek Shaw, and welcome to the stream. We've got a very, very special show for you today. Before we go any further, I want to welcome Ahmed and Khalid. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we're going to learn a lot about some of the things you're doing, but before we even get into anything, tell us why you're here in the U.S. Well, thank you for having me. Um, well, I'm, I'm on a tour, and I've done this tour several times since the revolution, since the beginning of the revolution. It's mm -hmm. not over yet. Um, basically, I used every chance that I have where microphone, my last movie, is in a festival in a city to um, talk about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Because, first of all, it was needed. Everybody wanted to know what's going on, especially yeah. the young people of the film were in Tahrir Square, in Al Qaeda Ibrahim Basha Square in Alexandria in, in, in the revolution. Uh, they wanted to know who, who are those young, educated Egyptians who started all this, mm -hmm. first of all. Second, what's going on now? Because the media focused, and we had a dramatic 18 days. But then little, 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 little news is trickling uh, outside of Egypt. And now, especially now, in the past two, three weeks, last month, mm -hmm. we have an iron fist. Almost, I call it a Nazi government mm -hmm. back in power in Egypt. And um, it was supposed to be the time to hand uh, the power to a civilian uh, body. Uh, right now, I, I can see that they think that it's all calm and maybe we can continue business as usual. Yeah. So I'm going around the world to make sure this is not going to happen spreading the Tahrir spirit, I call it. Yeah. Also, I'm using that in my new project, Tahrir al-Tahrir, which is a documentary, started on the 25th of Jan, which was ironically the day we released Microphone in Cairo, yeah. uh, to, the, to the 25th of Jan of 2012. Wow, so you're basically taking a year in the life of the revolution. Exactly, yeah. documenting it, making my new project, um, it's all about that. That's it's, amazing. It's well, actually, I, I feel like some of the meaning gets lost, because uh, in Arabic, doesn't it translate to the freeing of freedom? Actually, the name is interesting because it came up to me on the 25th of Jan. I happened to be in the premiere of Microphone in a theater mm -hmm. in Cairo. My director called and he said, I can't come. Yeah. I said, well, what? I'm in the protest. I said, we we're all going to the protest, but this is the premiere. You have to be here. I said, you don't understand. It's much bigger. It's tear gas bombs everywhere. Come. Bring the cameras. Come if you can. I managed to make it. Uh, to, to the higher square, and I found you know all the protests. I was shooting from the bridge, great view, all yeah. the protests coming, and they couldn't get into the higher square because the, the police was everywhere. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I, we can make a little documentary here about Tahrir al Tahrir, liberating liberation. I meant square yes. then, but of course, you knew what happened and it Absolutely. grew out of control, and right. now the meaning is liberating the meaning of liberation. Of liberation. Living mm. 30 years in dictatorship leaves you with a lot of things to liberate inside you. So the movie is about that. Yeah. Um, the, the documentary is about that. I think that, that what you just said, the leaving a lot of things to liberate, is so evident on the ground because getting rid of the dictator doesn't remove the infrastructure exactly. of oppression. Right. Uh, right. And we've seen this time and time again in all, all of the countries uh, that have at least seen a successful revolution with the Arab Spring. Egypt is obviously a bellwether. So we're really happy to have you here to Thank talk about me. this. Uh, Ahmed, I know that Egypt is a subject close and dear to your heart. Yes, so it is. I suspect that you'll have something to say today. Perhaps. I hope so. But, but people have a lot more to say than me. So. Well, our audience, but your input is going to be uh, valuable as well. And we want to hear from you. Definitely tweet us at AJ Stream. Today we're talking about the future of Egypt. Stay with us. We're going live on air. Hi, I'm Derek Ashong, and you are now in the stream. Today, Egypt has gone through a revolution, but what will it take to complete it? We put your questions to a popular Egyptian actor turned activist. Digital producer Ahmed Shahab El Din is here with us looking out for your live feedback. As always, tweet him using the hashtag AJStream. Joining him on the couch today is Egyptian actor, producer, and activist Khaled Abul Naga. Khaled, thank you so much for being with us. We were just talking in the pre-show about your latest project. Tell us a little bit about Microphone. Well, Microphone is not really my latest project. Uh, my latest project is uh, still, we're still working on it right now. We're writing the script. Uh, there's two. One is a documentary called Tahrir al-Tahrir, Liberating Liberation. And the other one is a script we're writing with young kids whom I'm very proud of, uh, breaking a lot of taboos, gender issues, um, telling monologues, plays usually. I found them 
they basically invited me to see their play in a, in a parking lot because they, could, mm -hmm. they failed to find a stage. We're writing a script now, which we call right now, the current name is We Are All Egyptians. And I'll mm. tell you more about that name. So um, Microphone, though, is, which is now in uh, the festival in, in DC sh screening, uh, is about the underground art scene um, and youth movement, uh, graffiti, rock bands, you name it, in the city of Alexandria. Mm -hmm. And we started by Ahmed Abdallah calling me, the director, calling me one day and saying, you, you have to see this, this graffiti. It's very progressive, and it's in, uh, in Alexandria. We met Aya Tariq, the girl who did the graffiti. She introduced us to the rock bands, to the, graf to the other bands, and then we, we thought there's something more interesting happening in Alexandria. There's a big underground youth movement. And we asked them to write wor uh, stories worth telling. They, we put, us, put, put them all on the table, and uh, we knew then that this has to be more than just a small documentary. This has to yeah. be a, a, a movie. And, and you uh, made a, a feature film made a feature about film it. Out. I want to show our audience a clip just to have some context of what you're talking about. This is part of the trailer from Microphone. <laughs> نفسي نعمل لهم حاجة نديهم صوت ممكن تقلل الفلسفة شوية؟ انت مش فاهم اللي بيحصل لي احنا في الأول وفي الآخر دولة فيها حرية تعبير تعالوا هنا تعالوا هنا فتصب حاجة Okay, now that is microphone. Now I have a couple of questions about this because it looks fascinating. And I was actually hoping to get to see it yesterday, but I, w I just got back in town, so unfortunately I couldn't. It says here microphone 2010, and that is in part because you finished the film last year. It was debuting on January 25th, as you mentioned, but that was obviously a very momentous day. So talk to us a little bit about what happened, as you said, when you guys decided to go from your screening to uh, Tahrir Square. Well, first of all, there's a very eerie timeline with this film. Yeah. We finished in towards the end of, of 2010. The first uh, festival was Toronto. We're very happy. One of the big four yeah. festivals in the world. And uh, first it, Arab festival was Tunis. Wow. And we got the best film award in Tunis. Congratulations. Then a number of days and mm -hmm. the revolution started in Tunis. We went to the Egyptian, the uh, Cairo Film Festival, uh, and we got the best Arabic film award there. And later, almost within the same number of days, the Egyptian revolution started on the 25th <laughs> of Jan. Uh -huh. And our release date was, uh, the slot we found uh, yeah. was 25th of Jan. So on the 25th of Jan, in the premiere, we are sitting there, as I told you, waiting for, for you know, the, the press and everybody, and uh, the revolution started, the protest started. We knew there was protest. Uh, actually, me and Mohammed Hevzi, my co-producer, we were laughing when we, were, we, when we said the date that 25th of Jan, I have protest, 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 and he said protest, protest, protest. I was like, okay, this is a revolution. Actually, in my diary, I wrote uh -huh. revolution, yeah. and we laughed about it. Yeah. Little did we know that this would be the first scheduled revolution in the world, in yeah. history. So. From, they, from that day, the new project started, and I didn't know that it would be my next project, but we took the cameras and, and went down and started shooting Tahrir Tahrir. Well, I think you're right. It is uncanny the kind of timing that you guys had with the debut of the film in Tunis mm. and then in Cairo. I, I keep joking here in D.C. when, uh -huh. when people see the film, yeah. I tell them, if you want a revolution in the States, <laughs> vote make for it the best film. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, <laughs> something is already bubbling in the States, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. One of the things I'm curious about is it seems that artists you know, have played a really phenomenal and, and fascinating role in this Arab Spring, in the, uh, the coming out party of the Arab youth in expressing their own voices. Talk to us a little bit about the artists in this movie, because we understand all the music we're hearing is from actual Egyptian artists who are playing themselves. Right. Actually, we didn't even write one piece of music or song for the film. Mm -hmm. This is all music and arts that we found, and we wanted to document, we wanted to document this in a, in a, in a documentary first, then a feature. 
and we just basically re-recorded them uh, in, in a good way so that they, they would be suitable for, for theaters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so basically we were trying to be as, as, as honest and as real as possible uh, with what's going on. But the most important thing that now, even looking back, that I think is even much more important than we even knew, is that these kids, these underground artists in Alexandria, yeah. have known and have the message that is, that is actually now becoming, I think, the nature of the new age, yeah. the, first, the first signs of a new age. I, would sum, I usually summarize it in my talk saying it's the time where the power of the people is finally challenging the people in power. Mm -hmm. Yes. There, and this is actually, I'm quoting Ghanim. Ghanim used that as well. And there's another quote from Khairi Abbas, a friend of mine, which says the same thing, which is that there's nobody anymore weak, too weak to accept or to, to, to accept losing his rights, mm -hmm. and no one too strong to dictate things on the, on the rest of the people. Yes. And this, this balance changing, I think, is just we're just entering a new age, not yes. only in Egypt, not only in, mm. I think we're just cre The reaching, playing field's being leveled. Right. There's an age we're entering where the critical number of people who believe in that, in what mm. I'm saying, is ab actually critical enough to actually affect the whole community. Absolutely. I think that it's happening around the world, and you see people around the world having this sense, I, I think largely inspired by what's happened in the Arab world this year, that yes, exactly. our voices need to be heard. Speaking of uh, having voices heard, we've got a ton of feedback from our audience in advance of you even coming here. And we had some people submit some video questions to us. Let's actually get the first. This is from Shafiq Ahmed Madani. Yeah, I want to ask Khalid Abu Nagar, what is his your contribution in the revolution, the current revolution? Have you added some films and short films and uh, dramas and so on? So he's asking, as an artist, what has been your contribution to the revolution? Well, I can tell you about my new project. I can tell you about uh, what I'm shooting, uh, what I'm doing as an activist. But, but to tell you the truth, the real contribution is being one, just one of yes. millions who basically went to the street and <laughs> chanted Aish uh, Hurriya, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is the three basic uh, uh, right. uh, chants that we, we, we and we said kept saying Madaniya, Madaniya, Al Askariya, Al Diniya, basically asking for a civil, just uh, uh, government, Egypt, mm -hmm. free Egypt, and I think this is the the real contribution. If you go to Tahrir Square, something amazing was happening was happening and, and a lot of people who went to Tahrir Square or the other squares in the cities in Egypt always say the same thing it was so peaceful yes. and I would be standing next to me somebody who is completely uneducated or, or very rich a CEO or, uh, or, a, or a man with his kids and everybody was the same nobody was on top of shoulders shouting nobody mm -hmm. was maybe here and there but I, I didn't do it I, the celebrities of the community were just one just one of everybody. And there was this sense of we're all the same. Yeah. Uh, Copts, Muslims, uh, you know, educated, uneducated, young, old, we're all the same. And we all have the same aspirations. We're here all equal. And that, I think, in my, would ne there's nothing in my life I'll be more proud of. Yeah. Just being one of, of the multitude. And well, I believe this is a sign of the new age as well, that, that everybody becomes one. Well, I think that idea of everyone becoming one is actually really powerful. And I want to play one more clip from your uh, movie, and then we're going to bring in some right. other voices into that's this a, conversation. That's a white Crew, it's a hip hop band, and okay. uh, this is one of their songs. All right, and there's some footage message. in this that is really interesting, specifically around that idea of we all being one. This is Y Crew. Yes. Yaman. Mashrasin. Check one, two. Yeah. الكل واقف ضدي بس انا مش لوحدي الموضوع ده مش هيعدي اعتبره تحدي مش هنحل ودي الاسلوب ده مش هيفيدني هو ده اللي عندي واللي ما بيسمعش اسمعني ناس وناس خلاص ما فيش احساس البني ادمين عندنا في مخهم في ترباس كل اللي حوالينا بيجروا بيجروا وبيجروا بس احنا في دولتنا بنسحب مش بنلد مزكتنا هتغيركوا بس شويه منكم سياستنا حته منكم خليها بيني وبينكم وانا عارف مش عاجبكم الحقيقه بتزعلكم بس انا مش جاي اتصحكوا وافوقكوا عشان نمتوا مؤامرات اه حكومات حكومات تستغل الانسان بالقوانين اه مشروع سين مشروع التحمير لاجل التطوير ديكتاتور تحسينات أمنية لحماية مسؤولين الدولة دية مظاهرات احتجاجية من فيها ساكن المساكن أغلبية 
من فيها حاكم أقلية رأس مالية مؤتمرات حكومية مشروع سين مشروع التحمير مشروع التحمير واكرو بيبي ذاتس واي Now, this particular clip that we shared includes original footage of pre-revolution protests focusing on the case of Khalid Saeed. He was a blogger who was allegedly tortured to death after being taken into Kali, uh, police custody. And if you look at this Facebook page, We Are All Khalid Saeed, this is actually a significant part of galvanizing support for the anti-Mubarak uprising. Two officers were recently convicted of manslaughter in his death and received prison sentences of seven years. It's a punishment that activists say isn't tough enough. This incident and more recent cases of alleged police abuse have increased calls for the interim government or the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces to transfer power no later than April. Just last week, another detainee, Assam Atta, also died in custody. And we have some footage here of that's worth taking a look at. Now this is footage from his funeral march. The woman you see here is actually his sister, who is obviously quite distraught. Human rights groups say that he was tortured to death. Atta was in jail for illegally occupying an apartment and was in fact appealing his case. Today we're going to be looking at the growing tensions between the citizens of Egypt and its interim military government. Now, Ahmed, I know that there have been a lot of recent developments on the ground and there's a ton of chatter online. Talk to us a little bit about what people are saying. Well, you know, the government uh, calls for the government to be held accountable have been happening on the street, but also online. And there's one story that's dominating our Twitterverse. For the second day, the hashtag Free Ala is drawing attention to the jailing of veteran blogger Ala Abdel Fatah on Sunday. Now, Ala has previously been in the stream to discuss his tweet nedwas or meetups, which bring Egypt's diverse online communities face to face in public life. Now, Ala is charged with inciting clashes between soldiers and Coptic Christians earlier this month. And protesters are blaming state TV for encouraging the violence against Christians and accusing the military of running over protesters. Now, some are questioning the motive behind the arrest. Let's look at this tweet from Muhammad Arakat right here. He says, Ala's arrest is a pure distraction tactic of SCAF. Now we've too many things to focus on. Now, it's worth mentioning that defense lawyers were not allowed to see the military prosecutor's evidence, but one blogger points to this video right here, a video of Ala, let me just play some of it for you. Now in this video, Ala is joking about the infamous slogan, or famous slogan now, Al Jaish wa Shab Eid Wahda, which means in English, the military and the people are one hand, or united hand in hand. He goes on to say, people want to now cut off the military's other hand. Now, activists are using this arrest to raise awareness about the continued use of military trials for civilians in Egypt. Ala's wife, Manal, a leading opponent of military trials, tweeted this today. Right here you see a photo, actually this is just the photo of uh, one of many photos that was circulating online showing Manal and Ala. But this was her tweet, she said, few weeks ago I found a box of letters when Ala was in prison in 2006. Now that was of course under Mubarak. And then she writes, here I am writing new letters once again. And San Monkey, uh, for those of you who don't know, Mahmoud Salem, he's another famous uh, blogger. He says, Dear Scaf, thanks for making our point for us by arresting Ala. We now have free Ala campaign pre and post revolution. You are the same regime, he writes, as Mubarak, presumably. Now, the military has tried thousands of civilians, I think upwards of uh, six, twelve, some even say 16,000 civilians in military courts since taking charge of Egypt after Mubarak's ouster in February. So Derek, that's one of the stories that's really trending online. Thank you, Ahmed. So let's take a deeper look at all of this. Joining us now is Mona Saif, an Egyptian activist and blogger. She's the sister of Allah Abdel Fattah, who was detained yesterday morning. Mona, welcome to the stream. Welcome, hi. Hi. So now, first of all, talk to us about the detention of your uh, brother. Why do you believe he's been detained? Um, I believe that he has been detained and I believe that he has been summoned up as um, as a statement from the SCAF, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces. I think they are sending us a warning. They are scaling up their um, uh, battle with us and their confrontation with us to target prominent 
activists is definitely a warning signal. And we have one of two choices. Either we also um, escalate our response right. uh, and our confrontation with them, or they gain what they have, what they've been aiming to uh, gain with that move. Khaled, you seem to be in agreement. Absolutely. Uh, Amona, how are you? Hi. How do you feel? <laughs> You're good? Keep up the good spirit. You, we will win. We will prevail. As we did, uh, as we got uh, Mubarak ousted, we will get the SCAF ousted. I have no doubt about that. We have and to escalate. I, I, we have to stand firm. We will unite. The best thing that ever happened is usually something stupid uh, Mubarak regime or SCAF does. And they did it. And guess what? Something very genius your brother did, which is refusing to be trialed by a military trial because they don't, you cannot try someone if you're part of the, the case. So I think it's a genius uh, step, and I believe the whole world, not only the Egyptians, the whole free world is going to be back this and point the fingers at what I call really Nazi government or rulers not right now in Egypt. Now, Mona, we're having a number of comments coming in from our online community, so we want to give them a chance to pose some questions both to you and Khali. Yeah, Mona, we have uh, from Veritas online saying, what is the Muslim Brotherhood's stance on SCAF issue in Egypt? Why aren't they taking part in the demonstrations? Now, I bring this question up because we've seen that the Muslim Brotherhood did come out in support of your brother, Ala. Um, they did come out in support of the ending of military trials, but despite calls from, you know, now the Muslim Brotherhood, liberals, youth coalitions, and even, you know, President Obama in the U.S., a couple days ago, the military is not budging. What do you make of the divisions in, in uh, Egypt's political system? Well, the truth is, the, the, especially when we talk about criticizing SCAF and coming to confrontations with SCAF, it's not really only Muslim Brotherhood who are constantly having um, a hesitant uh, uh, state, yeah. statement uh, towards it. It's uh, most uh, and many of the political uh, groups and political parties, um, they are not uh, constantly willing to keep an ongoing and an escalating um, battle uh, regarding SCAF. So Muslim Brotherhood do that as well. Uh, it took us a lot of time for them and for other parties to uh, publicly declare a uh, refusal of military trials of civilians. But uh, till now, them and other parties, whenever there's a big crime, they, they seem to be moving back and forward um, regarding how how brutal should, should they be in uh, accusing the army and judging the army and confronting them? Oh. Um, and I think, I think, I honestly, I don't think they matter. I think the street matter, the people in the street matter, and the people in the street are very uh, obviously rising against CAF and the army and the army uh, crimes more and more now. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to get actually a couple of comments coming in from online. One is coming from Sarah Abdul Rahman, who's saying that Khalid Said was not allegedly tortured to death. It was proved. And this actually brings up a very interesting question that was also sent to us uh, by a video. I'm going to let it play for itself. The murders of Khalid Said and Asamata are two very disturbing stories of torture. The word torture is often used in news, but few mainstream outlets describe in graphic detail the reality of these experiences. As a producer, journalist, and activist, what do you feel is the appropriate way to describe torture to media audiences? So Khaled, let me bring this to you first. I mean, we say people are tortured, but we don't get into the details of what that really means. Is the media doing a disservice by not speaking explicitly about this? How do you strike that balance of telling the truth about what's really going on? Well, it's very simple. Torture is torture. You, you cannot go to a police station for any kind of crime. And even if, you, if it was like 100% sure if you, that, and, and torture people or humiliate, humiliate them. The revolution slogan the, the, basically asks for dignity, mm -hmm. dignity. And that's what a lot of politicians, a lot of media just, just dismissed and didn't get. People in Egypt stood up for their own dignity back. The police being, being the arm of repression during the Mubarak regime, now that the police is, is squashed, now, the press being controlled by the military now in power. I don't know if you're following the news, but what's happening actually in the past two or three weeks, Yusri Fouda, a great uh, uh, journalist, you know him, he was in Al Jazeera, uh, actually made, drew the line. He made a press conference and said, I cannot anymore have a free talk show. Mm -hmm. He's, he is one of the voices of the revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, Bilal Fadl had his column white, empty, as a statement, I cannot 
have the freedom of expression as a journalist. Ibrahim Isa and Tahrir TV, all that is happening. That tells you that the people in power now in Egypt are afraid. Mm -hmm. They are at their weakest, and we have to strike hard now for them to hand the power to the people who started this revolution. <laughs> I want to just quote Hillary Clinton. Yes. Hillary Clinton said a few weeks ago that the military in power in Egypt are going according to plan. Mm -hmm. I want to ask her what plan, if the people in Tahrir Square don't have any schedule or plan of handling the power to the civil uh, society. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is why people like you, people here in, in the States, people all over the world should know and should be very aware that politicians sometimes have no clue, are clueless, and they're actually going to completely the wrong well, direction. This brings back the point you made earlier about this becoming a global thing where people are starting to have this sense of we are one and we are willing to stand up for our rights worldwide. And one of the things that's worth considering is that, you know, politicians like uh, Secretary of State Clinton were caught completely off guard by the Egyptian revolution. Who's to say that they have a better grasp on what's happening now than what's happened before? I think that the kind of comments we're getting from our community, uh, and I think that this we should bring some to Mona, those kind of comments in some ways, elicit, um, they illustrate a greater grasp of the nuance of what's going on and the reality of what it is than some of the statements we're hearing from politicians. Um, well, no, there's very, you know, many videos that are sent to us. One of the tweets that came in was from Befroggled. She says, military trials for civilians, virginity tests, jailing bloggers and deaths, Isam Atas, for example, ensure that scaps days are numbered. But many see the protest movement as failing in bringing about a civilian government. You know, it's been almost a year now since the revolution. And we still see, you know, certain people are in power. Habib al-Adli is leaving prison. Um, why is, for example, Mubarak being tried in a civilian court and civilians in a military court? What will bring an end to this? Protesting in the streets? Um, not just protesting. I think people are looking at it from a very small angle and not the proper angle. The truth is, it is no longer about protest in the street or protest in squares. It is about taking the spirit of Tahrir and the different squares that we have ex that we have lived in the first 18 days to every single institution and every single factory, and this is what's happening. You are having strikes in most professions, in every factory, in university faculties, and in uh, in schools, and in in, in even you have you are, we are now here about strikes even among policemen and among Ministry of Interior. So basically what you have is a different movement of um, leading to civil, civil disobedience against the whole system. And, and the truth is, it, it is really naive to assume that removing Mubarak would have solved it all. Because right. these and are on the that point, Mona, I want to interrupt you because we're going to go directly to that in the post show. We're going to ask for you to stay with us. Thank you so much, Mona. Thank you, Khalid, as well. And thank you, Ahmed. We're going to continue this conversation. We want you to know that on our next show, we look at how Palestinians are going outside the peace process to gain recognition. Before we go, we're going to leave you with another song from microphone. Stay with us. Hi, welcome back. We are talking today about the future of Egypt and the relationship of the citizenry to the Supreme Council of Armed Forces. I want to go back to Mona Saif. She made a very interesting point just before we left about it being naive to assume that the ouster of Mubarak would be the end of the revolution. Mona, talk to us a little bit more. What needs to happen for the revolution to find a conclusion? What's really happening now, you ha you've had a country that lived under a corrupted system for decades. It is 
very easy to assume that most of those in power in every different institution are part of the old regime. And so everyone has to sort of go through a small revolution within every institution and a cleansing process within every institution. And now we also have the SCAF, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, part of the equation who are, they are the old generals, they are the best buddies of Mubarak, and you are rising against them. So it's, it's not the same adrenaline rush like 18 days of um, focusing on ousting Mubarak. It's, it's a much more um, slower and, and I think painful <laughs> um, process, but it is, but I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful only because people are feeling empowered and people are feeling a sense of ownership towards the country that was not there at all during Mubarak's era. Mona, one quick question. What about the role of the international community? We saw a lot of people lauding what happened in Egypt following the uh, departure of Mubarak. Where do you see the support or lack thereof now from the international community? Um, yeah, and I see the support of international community playing a very vital role, especially when it comes to issues like exposing uh, Supreme Council of Armed Forces and army violations towards citizens. We are talking about unarmed people facing an, ar an armed uh, army that is really trying to preserve the, uh, the status of the old regime. Uh, we have seen, the, for example, the virginity checks that were forced on protesters in March 9th, uh, protesters detained in March 9th, and really what helped us to expose this uh, issue and this crime was the support of international communities, as well as many other cases, especially when it comes to military trials of, uh, military trials of civilians. I think international community could give a lot of support to the revolution, and when I say international community, I'm actually really more talking about people and about this global revolution that seems to be spreading all over to other countries uh, and not really about governments. Mona, you, uh, you speak of a global revolution. We have a tweet coincidentally from Daniel Weed saying police have way too much power there, referring to Egypt, but then he says, and every other country I can think of, including the U.S. But Khaled, I want to put this question to you because you know, we hear of you know, the need for elections, the need for transition from military rule, which Egypt's been in for decades, you could argue, even under Mubarak, even now. We have Joe Dyke asking, question, how free do you think the elections will be? How heavily do you think SCAF will disrupt them? So do you think elections, as they're slated in November, is, uh, is in need right now? Is that what's needed? Judging by what's happening right now, I'll leave the answer to everybody. Judging by... I mean, basically getting all those voices of the revolution shut down, bloggers detained, right. mm -hmm. um, basically harassing everybody who's criticizing, mm -hmm. criticizing even the military. Mm -hmm. What do you think? And what are they thinking? It's a joke. I think later on in history, we're, we're going to look at this time, and it's a big joke. First of all, ousting Mubarak, I think it was just a, a, a deal. Omar Suleiman, the architect of it, he's still going to his office, by the way, every day. Right. Very strange. And basically, yeah. It's, it's obvious. Habib al Adli. Habib al Adli is getting on, yeah. Basically, they think, oh, it's going to pass. We're going to control this. It's a damage control process. Mubarak, we're going to just make a, you know, a, a play, whatever you, mm -hmm. you can call this, mm -hmm. of, of trying Mubarak. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to give the people whatever that makes them calm and go back. And they think we were, this is already happening. They don't know that we didn't mm -hmm. really oust Mubarak. We didn't no. really oust Din al Abidin mm -hmm. in Tunis. We ousted fear. There's no more fear, no more, people are not afraid anymore, they will not be ruled by fear anymore. And there's nothing as strong as the message that whatever happened in Tunis inspired the streets in Egypt, right. and whatever happened in Egypt and Tunis inspired yeah. Syria, Libya, Qatar. And at the same time, you know, Mubarak would say, oh, Egypt is not Tunis. And then whatever, whatever happened in mm -hmm. Egypt, Libya, right. uh, Gaddafi would say, oh, Libya is not Tunis, Tunis or Egypt. Bashar al-Assad right. says, Egypt and Tunis and Libya is not Syria. Guess right. what? Egypt is Tunis, is right. Libya, we're all right. the same. And there's nothing more strong, more stronger message that, that these people have the same aspirations. Right. Yeah. And there is a, a collective Arab consciousness, yeah. a united it, Arab awakening. So much so that I just want to point out that, you know, today when I was looking at the hashtag uh, uh, Free Ala, I saw that there were protests at the Egyptian embassy in Tunis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Slim Amamou was one of the people who was there. He was a former youth minister from Tunisia. But I still want to just ask you about the Catch-22, because lots of people are tweeting in. For example, uh, let me just go back here for a second, if you bear with me. 
We have Sarah723 saying, it's not just about the 12,000 convicted by the military. It's about questioning, questioning the legitimacy of military rule. And that's the genius thing that Ala did. Mm -hmm. The genius thing about that mm -hmm. is that he didn't go and say, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I, you can't, right. I didn't do this or didn't do that. No, he, he questioned the whole idea that a civilian can be trialed by a, by a, by a military court. Uh, th this whole thing can actually dismiss everybody who's mm -hmm. in jail right now. They were our friends. They were chanting next to us. It was all as a way of getting hold, c controlling mm -hmm. this youth that started the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a joke, really, what's going on. And so I think I, that was genius, that what Allah did. I want to bring this back to you, Mona, then. The question of what happens next and what perhaps what is the end game from the perspective of the SCAF. You know, all of the countries that have had seen these revolutions in recent months have also had an economic impact. And I'm curious if you think that the uh, economic pain that people in Egypt are currently feeling can be leveraged by the Supreme Council of Armed Forces to try to maintain and stabilize their power? Or do you feel that the sentiments on the ground are strong enough that people will continue to advocate their, for change irrespective of what's happening economically? The sentiments are on the ground, I think, are strong enough and getting stronger and stronger because the truth is, you like Western media and the media tells the story of the activists who are being targeted by the brutality of the Supreme Council of Armed Forces. But the truth is, the real victims are thousands of citizens, thousands of Egyptians that are not actually particularly involved in any political mobilization in the street, but they are also facing. Uh, unfair military trials, getting sentenced, and they are not getting any attention. And these are the real victims of the oppression of the SCAF, and these are the real people who are gradually rising more and more against SCAF. And, and as long as SCAF continues to not settle their demands, their basic demands of minimum wage and proper living and proper health conditions and proper health system and education system for the kids, as long as they do not do that, and as long as they, they escalate their oppression, which mainly targets those people more than the activists, those people are going to continue build, building up their anger, and they are going to strike more and more back against Kaf. Mona, in terms of uh, questioning the legitimacy, which you touched on, but also Khaled brought up, we see this tweet from Fadi Al-Qadi, who's saying, I'm hearing that Ahmed Saif, the father of, yeah, I guess your father, is calling for a new tactic to refuse SCAF military interrogation from now on. He's saying this is very important. Now, in your opinion, shifting gears slightly, do you think, it's kind of a blunt question, that the, gov the military is trying to divide the Egyptian people? Perhaps one Obviously. example might be, and Khalid, feel free to jump in, what happened in Maspero, regardless of who was at fault. That was one of the biggest criticisms, you know, the idea of divide and conquer. Do you think that's yeah. what they're trying to do strategically? They are constantly, definitely trying to do that, uh, whether through the Maspiro event, trying to divide Copts and Muslims, or whether pre to that, uh, or during um, April 9th when they attacked the square and they first spread the rumors of those people being uh, funded and thugs and so on. So they are constantly trying to create all sorts of rifts. But the thing is, they are working with the same manual as Mubarak, they make the same stupid mistakes, and eventually they do not channel um, their oppressive tools towards only one sector of people, so eventually they do trigger the anger of more and more and more people. With the Maspiro events, they triggered the anger of thousands, maybe millions of cops, but they also, and they also triggered the anger of many of the activists. And because we have our tools and because we are working on it, we are working on exposing more and more the real stories behind what they do to gain more and more popular support. Now, Khalid, I want to bring this back to you. Again, at your honor tour right now, I understand you're visiting six different countries. What kind of response are you getting from people outside, in, outside of Egypt with regard to their awareness of what's happening in the country right now and the degree of support? That goes exactly to the basic idea about my new movie. And I can't be more passionate about anything in my life as much I am about this. It really takes this energy, this, this, this rage of what's going on in Egypt and the Arab world, and really goes back to what's going on in the world. And it put, them, put them all together. Feeling that this is a new age, that the power of the people now is stronger than the people in power, and basically all the changes that's happening right now in the world have the same nature. 
the same nature, meaning that, that we cannot anymore be fooled by people, by politicians, by people like Scaff now. It's over, as we, as we saw it in, in the high school, game over. Mm -hmm. And that's why I believe I'm very optimistic. This is why uh, also Mona is, is very hopeful, because we know that we, we ousted something much more important than, than this or that. Now, history will look back at this period of time, and it will be the, the, the laugh, really, that we gave so much time to people like Scaff, the buddies of Mubarak, yeah. that the, the opportunity to basically, actually they had the opportunity to, to actually clean the record, but actually instead they did the same thing again. So mm -hmm. I think it's over. What I'm doing in every city that I visit now is I'm getting, keeping everybody tuned yeah. um, through personal contact, getting feedback, and I'm all putting, that, putting all that in my, my, in my new project as well. And it's very mm -hmm. important to, to hear people personally and talk to them personally, because no matter what you do on Twitter and Facebook, it's, it's one thing. Uh, having a movie uh, in festivals is one thing, but meeting people in themselves and listening mm -hmm. uh, to each other is, is another thing. And I think it's Absolutely. very important to do it, not only me, a lot, a lot of activists around the world and back in Egypt. I tell you, we need it in Egypt too, because the media in Egypt right now the mo the, 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 what, what it's doing right now, what SCAF is basically pushing it to do, is to keep people frustrated, keep people uh, feel that there's no hope. You know mm. what, well, let's go back to what we had. It was better than anything. And that will never happen. That will never happen as long as me, her, everybody is still talking. And this is, again, a, slogan, a, a word that I use in my new uh, film, and, and it's actually by uh, Mona Shimi, a, a co-writer. Those who tell will never die. And on that note, we thank you so much for telling your story today. And we want to thank you, Mona, as well. Uh, thank you, Ahmed, for getting our community involved. This is an ongoing story, and we will be continuing to cover it on the stream. Remember, you can tweet us using the hashtag AJStream. Stay a part of this conversation. We will continue to follow what is happening in Egypt.